kind of youth films, I think, to escape into a world, a world of fantasy away from my parents, who I love and who are alive and having a great time, but have remarried since the divorce. But during the time of my filmmaking days as a te teenager or preteen, my parents weren't getting along, and there was a lot of noise in the house at night. And uh, I, I think that it was a, an escape for me, a, a great escape for me. I used to collect model trains. I'd put them together, and I used to have amazing train wrecks. I remember thinking, well, how am I going to perpetuate and kind of prolong the moment of a great crash? How can I enjoy it more? And I remember one day borrowing my father's camera, 8 millimeter camera, which was, a, which was only in the house to, you know, collect memories on film. Now the, everybody uses, you know, video and, and the like, but we had 8 millimeter then. And I remember uh, taking the camera and staging the last train wreck on film from all angles, cutting back and forth to the one train approaching left to right and the second train approaching right to left and close-ups of the little people staring as if they were about to witness a, some sort of disaster, which indeed was about to happen. And then, of course, filming from a two-shot, the trains coming together and going over the tracks. And trying to get the lens as low to the tracks as possible to give the train some stature and some, some reality. And I remember uh, looking at the film over and over again, 20, 30 times. How old you when you did that? I, I was about 12 years old. It's less storytelling and more like looking at a grand menu. You, you know, you just sort of get to see what's on the shark's menu and who he's going to go after. And uh, for me, it was just a lot of fun to make a movie about an inevitable confrontation between man and his elements. Can you talk in detail, or a little more detail, uh, about one sequence in Jaws, for example, where Scheid is on the beach, uh, uh, his wife's massaging his neck, and he's looking for the shark. Well, I just remember wanting to do, introduce five potential victims and just set up a kind of projected paranoia from Roy Scheider's position in his straight back beach chair. He knows there's a shark out there. He knows that there's something swimming out there that's as large as a station wagon. Chief Brody's nightmares are fulfilled in that one moment where the camera trombones or zoom dollies to stretch his paranoia into reality, which was the whole purpose of that sh particular shot. But I've always wanted to do that shot, but, you know, I wanted to save it for a very important place in that movie to use it. It's the kind of shot that was used too, too many times. It, it, it's abused, and, and people get very tired of looking at it. It also can cause, you know, seasickness in a movie theater. Close Encounters was the first feature film that you yourself wrote. Uh, that must make it more personal. Where, where did it start in the back of your mind? Well, it really started from just a feeling that I always had as a kid that whatever's up there in space, and I was convinced, I think, as early as I can remember, that there is life in space off this planet. That whatever is out there has to be friendly, and I wanted to bring it closer to Earth. One celebrated aspect of the Close Encounters film is the sophistication of the technology. In fact, when I first saw it, I thought that one of the reasons, one of the reasons why it was so popular and so marvelous to look at was that, that the cinema became one of the few places where you could realize there was modern technology. We're all being told that we live in a land of wonderful, an era of wonderful technology, but all we see, we earthlings, is the odd rocket taking off. Exactly. And uh, inside our houses, the uh, telephone doesn't work. Exactly. And that's what we see. So actually, the cinema was saying, no, no, you do live in an age of modern technology. Look what we can do in the right. cinema. I, I agree with you. That's how I saw part of the movie having made it, um, after having made it. I really want, you know, America, when we first landed on the moon, there was 12-hour coverage. I mean, as, as long as they were up there and possibly in jeopardy, as long as there was drama in space, the three networks and all the independent stations really covered the heck out of it. And in a way, I felt good because I saw this um, tremendous technology from this planet that put men on the moon for the first time. It ma made me really proud to be an American, to be part of the 20th century, and to be growing up in the age of technology, and then super technology, and then soon quantum technology. And I was so excited about all of this that I thought, what if it wasn't a man on the moon, but what if it were creatures coming here and meeting us for the first time? We wouldn't receive them on the White House lawn. We certainly wouldn't receive them um, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a tent in the middle of you know the Gobi Desert. We probably would arrange a, a meeting where the two technologies, 
quantum and terrestrial could meet for the first time and exchange information. This was a movie about not them versus us, but about a gift coming from there. It was a celebration of, of, a, of a meeting more glorious than, uh, than I think when man crawled out of the sludge and, you know, learned how to make a fire and, you know, Christopher Columbus traded with the, you know, Indians. And I just think it was probably the most historic meeting and it, it should be celebrated. It should be, a, it, should, it, it should be the 4th of July. You went to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Did you go there to Raiders of the Lost Ark at the invitation of George Lucas? Did he invite you to get involved in that? No, I, 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 I kind of bribed my way on board that one. He told me the story just because I said I wanted to make a James Bond movie someday, and he said, I got a better film than James Bond. And we, we were in Hawaii in 1977 before his film opened, Star Wars opened. He told me the Raiders story, and I said, you're right, I want to do it. He said, well, I don't know, there's another director who's helping me with this right now. And I said, well, if he ever falls out, called me and the director fell out and he called me about a month later and I, 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 then I wound up doing the mu movie. What sort of uh, preparation do you put into a sequence like that? We, you've uh, kindly let us copy off uh, some of your uh, storyboards for that. Uh, how long would it take you to do those and uh, is that all the preparation or is that part of the preparation? Well certainly the storyboards are a springboard for all divisions in a film to come together and discuss costume and makeup, what special effects are needed. Um, uh, certainly, uh, often the lighting, uh, the source of the lighting, the mood of the scene, was it dark, is it bright, is it lit by torch, is it lit by sun coming through a small crevice in a cave? But it, 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 it's, it's the beginning of all conversations in production meetings, and it's a, really a way to, to, to uh, shortcut. I don't like being too verbose about a movie. I don't like having to repeat myself or to, or to individually talk to people. I'd rather have everybody who's involved in a particular shot or effect to all be together in, a, in sort of like a huddle, like a football game, and better to be in the huddle with a big drawing of what you're trying to achieve than with a lot of, lot of words, because everybody interprets words objectively. Do you have any rules for filming action? No, there's no rules. There's a law of science. I don't believe there's a, there's a law of cinema. I think rules tend to, you know, tend to st stagger and topple people who really dr dream and are dreamers. I think it's... Uh, you you know. think that's where it all comes out of? I think all com movies, movies are dreams. They really are. They're, they're daydreams that uh, you often get bad grades over when you're not concentrating on the schoolwork. And uh, you grow up being a daydreamer like I did, and then someday you take those daydreams, you turn them into, you turn them into something. I think that cinema is a, a very, very, very personal, highly interpretive um, extension of, of, of an idea which is invisible. And then you've got to somehow make it physical. What drew you to E.T.? Just uh, loneliness, I guess. A great appeal to the stars for a good friend and somebody who would be with me and be my magical buddy and you know show me things that I couldn't possibly imagine and I would show him things that he probably couldn't possibly imagine and we would have this rather cosmic uh, relationship. And I wanted to make a love story. I wanted to do a film about American kids. And uh, they all sort of came together in E.T. So you had these ideas that you wanted to do all these things. Were you looking across scripts? Were you thinking of ideas for yourself? Do you, did you actually go into the business of seeking a project to fit these uh, interests and uh, demands no, of no, yours? No, because that's all subconscious thought. That's all the stuff that sort of just runs through your head, rambles through your head. I, when I was making Close Encounters, I thought, what if I take the creature at the end of Close Encounters and keep him on Earth and then tell his story someday? I mean, I mean, it's always been on my mind to explore a relationship between a creature and a, and a small child. Elliot's father is recently separated from his mother, and he is a kid without a family, a real unit. And he's on the verge of probably becoming not a very nice kid in a couple of years. He's, he's not going bad. He's certainly, no way you can see the movie and imagine him to be a juvenile delinquent. But you can't imagine him withdrawing more and more and deeper and deeper into kind of an evolving depression. And in a way, E.T. coming into his life is providence. Would you say there's a sense in which E.T. is, is a, a, some sort of plea for a permanent childhood? Yeah, I think it's probably, part, part of it is me, you know, calling out, saying to myself, you know, I'm 34 years old, I'm not married, I don't have kids, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be married, I'm probably going to have kids. Is this going to be my last summer vacation before I have to be a responsible adult? 
and uh, maybe Ed represents my last summer summer before going back to school. You know, the school of hard knocks in real life. I hope not. 